I'm Wes Spain. I'm a senior fellow here at the uh, Center for Global Security Research, and I have the very distinct pleasure of introducing our guest speaker today, Dr. Wayne Breckus. Wayne is a professor of sociology at the University of Missouri and researches and develops sociological theory and cultural cognition, social identities, and the sociocognitive dimensions of markedness and unmarkedness. You're going to hear more about that today, so I want to elaborate. Uh, one of the great strengths of this laboratory, I believe, is its real serious embrace of multidisciplinary research. Um, and so what can we as a national security laboratory, a science and a technology laboratory, learn from a, uh, a sociologist in sociology? And I would argue quite a bit. And I hope you'll agree at the end of this talk today. So I first came across Wayne's work a couple of years back when I was doing some research uh, for some a project Zach Davis leads here on um, a strategic latency, and I was trying to understand why some of the technological threats that the national security community have warned of for decades, uh, primarily in the context of terrorism and, and bioterrorism being an obvious example, why, why those threats haven't really manifest themselves? Why haven't we seen you know, successful bioterrorist attacks um, uh, to the scale and impact that had been forecasted for decades. And so in doing that work, I came across Wayne's research. I'm not quite sure how now as I think about it. But, <laughs> but I, I came across a piece he, he had written several years ago called The Mundane Manifesto. And I would, I would certainly refer you to that. It's really interesting. And again, I'm sure he'll touch on it a bit today, at least, at least the substantive content of that. And his work really you know, pushed me and really challenged a lot of the basic assumptions I think we have in the uh, national security assessment community. Um, uh, it certainly drove that research I was doing on a path that I hadn't anticipated and got me to a place that was not what I was expecting at all. And so I think his work is very impactful. I think it's very applicable to national security work. And I hope you'll be as intrigued as I was after his talk today and would continue down this path. Uh, so with that, let me introduce and welcome and please join me, Dr. Wayne Breckus. To, uh, Wayne's going to speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll take question and answers. We're going to video record the presentation, then we'll stop the video recording. We'll do Q&A, and then uh, and we'll wrap up by noon at the latest. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. It's my, oh, yeah, my mic is working. Um, uh, first, uh, thank you to Wes and to the lab for inviting me to speak here today. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I should start with a bit of a confession uh, that my talk might be a little bit unusual, uh, maybe even marked um, compared to other talks in this series. Um, I, you know, I looked at your page and, and you've brought in an impressive group of speakers with strong expertise in national security issues. Uh, unlike your other speakers, I, I would say that uh, I'm not really a national security expert. My first research was not on terrorism or biological weapons or cyber attacks or things like this. Instead, it was an ethnographic study of how ordinary, relatively mundane, suburban gay men present their identities to others. So how did I get from gay suburban identity <laughs> to my more recent activity, cognitive sociology and the mental models people use to interpret the world? And how does this relate to the topic I'm discussing today, the mundanity of risk and danger? When I was writing my first book in the 1990s and early 2000s, my work drew a lot of attention for its novelty. Because at the time, almost all the work on gay male culture and identity was focused on the most interesting gay enclaves in urban areas, such as the Castro in San Francisco, the village in New York, and West Hollywood and Los Angeles. The idea that gay men were ordinary was academically novel at the time, even though, in fact, my ordinary suburban gay subjects were not novel in reality. I was actually studying the center of the bell curve of gay presentation and style. Both gay culture, but gay culture was defined both within scholarship and in media at the time by its empirically interesting outliers. A point that further became clear when a graduate student I was working with proposed studying lesbian life in a Midwestern town. 
she had her funding proposal rejected by a reviewer who said that the Midwest wasn't a good location for studying lesbian culture and identity and that she should go to one of the coasts instead. The clear implication of the reviewer's suggestion was that if we want to understand lesbian culture and identity, we need to go to Portland or Santa Cruz or Boston to find the most authentic lesbians. <laughs> the boring, Quitoti, there's nothing to see here, <laughs> it's flyover country. The boring Quitotian lesbians of the Midwest simply won't do and won't tell us what we need to know about lesbians and lesbian culture. So I noticed there was a tendency in my area of study for people to mistake the salient for the typical. And I became interested in this tendency not just in LGBTQ studies, but more generally. How did we lose sight of the ordinary gay man or lesbian? And moreover, how did we lose sight of the ordinary period? I took up this question in a mundane manifesto where I observed that investigations of social life often begin with that which is already visible and named because of its exoticness or its heavily articulated moral and political significance. Part of the answer about how we lo lose sight of the mundane has to do with how cultural communities, large and small, agree on categories of social life. The extraordinary and the defaults, the marked and the unmarked. I therefore developed an interest in specializing in sociological theory that looks at the cultural elements of cognition and attention, and at the attentional differences that we place on marked or remarkable features of social reality compared to unmarked or mundane features of social reality. It is this distinction between the culturally and socially marked and the unmarked that I will focus on today. I'm going to start very generally with just an overview of the marked in, in everyday life and how these processes work, uh, paying attention to some of the attentional asymmetries, uh, the consequences of these asymmetries, um, then I'll move into talking about it in terms of risk, and then I'll talk about security implications. To frame my talk, I begin with the concepts of the marked and the unmarked. These concepts were first introduced in linguistics in the 1930s by Nikolai Trubetskoy and Roman Jakobson. In studying phoneme pairs, Trubetskoy noted that one side of a pair was always marked and actively highlighted, while the other was defined in default by its absence of any markers, and thus unmarked. Jakobsen expanded the observation by noting that every constituent of any linguistic system is built on the contrast between the marked presence or unmarked absence of an attribute. The linguistic contrast between the marked and the unmarked closely follows visual psychology's distinction between figure and ground. The marked represents the focus figure of any contrast while the, while the unmarked represents the unaccented ground. These concepts also apply to our non-visual mental perception of the world. We actively attend to and mark some items of our environment as noteworthy and take for granted other elements as unremarkable. The marked represents those elements of a social contrast that are actively defined as exceptional or remarkable and socially specialized while the unmarked represents the vast expense, expanse of social reality that is passively defined as unremarkable and thus socially generic. Um, we, we can see here the unmarked usually represents the cognitive default, the things we don't think about. The marked is novel and special. It's also usually smaller than the unmarked. Uh, the unmarked is uh, mundane, ordinary, boring. The marked is compelling, uh, and uh, things can be marked because they're statistically extraordinary, um, often at the tails of the bell curve. Uh, they can be marked for their uh, perceived moral importance. Uh, by comparison, those things that we don't access uh, tend to be uh, statistically normal, uh, the fatter part of the bell curve, uh, and are often then also implied or assumed to be morally safe, innocent, neutral or harmless. We're, we're not as concerned with the generic as with the specialized. 
uh, I outlined in five kind of characteristics uh, of the marking process or five properties. One is that the mark is heavily articulated with social and moral weight, uh, while the unmarked remains mostly unarticulated and taken for granted. So we have a greater focus on the marked. We uh, write more about it. Uh, we think more about it. Uh, the marking process exaggerates the importance and distinctiveness of the marked. The marked receives disproportionate attention relative to its size and frequency, while the unmarked, which is quite large, is rarely attended to, even though it is usually greater. Distinctions within the marked tend to be ignored, making it appear more homogeneous than the unmarked. And relatedly, the marked are therefore also often defined and colored by their most visible and stereotypical representatives. Characteristics of a marked member or marked identity or marked event are often generalized to all members of the marked category, but not beyond the category, while attributes of an unmarked member are either perceived as idiosyncratic to the individual case or universal to the human condition. Language plays a significant role in articulating the distinction between the marked and socially specialized and the unmarked and socially generic and taken for granted. When we linguistically mark something, we are essentially qualifying it as specialized form that we must distinguish from its more generic form. Take, for example, some terms like African American, single mom, and family business. These terms not only mark a special type of American mom or business, but they also implicitly define by contrast the generic American as white, the generic mom as married, and the generic business as corporate. The marking process exaggerates the distinctiveness of the marked, emphasizing its extreme features while underplaying the extremes of the unmarked. For example, the night as the mark time of day is often culturally represented as dangerous because crimes at night are seen as representative of the risks of nightly interaction, yet the day, the unmarked time of day, is now represented as potentially dangerous because of its high rates of farm accidents, household falls, child injuries, and traffic accidents. Teen cultures are often judged by their more oppositional members uh, millennials by those self-centered Instagram attention seekers. Um, uh, but, but perhaps a, a vivid example of the ways we think very differently about the sensational aspects of the marked and the unmarked is the following example here. Oh, sorry about that. Back when I was teaching deviance at Rutgers in the 1990s, I was struck by the book jacket of the autobiography of Monster Cody Scott, a notorious ex-LA gang member who was responsible for multiple homicides and had been shot multiple times, where in the book was praised for giving eloquent voice to the black ghetto experience of today. As interesting as the book is for its look into the extraordinary individual life of Monster Cody Scott in the ghetto, his life as the most extreme member of the most extreme set of the most extreme gang in the United States with one of the most established gang cultures and a string of multiple homicides and near death experiences was actually far from representative of the black ghetto experience for all black individuals living in urban ghettos. To illustrate the asymmetry of this kind of statement, Imagine a biography of Timothy McVeigh being lauded as giving eloquent voice to the white heartland experience in America today. <laughs> we can see here that the cognitive asymmetry. Um, you know, we could imagine a book about Timothy McVeigh maybe being colored as represented of his political identity, but not his white heartland experience. Once we distinguish a category or issue verbally and ascribe to it memorable and extreme characteristics, that category or issue captures our attention and engages our imagination. When focused on the remarkable rather than the unremarkable, the tendency is to highlight only the very remarkable rather than the slightly remarkable. 
with the mark, the most spectacular representatives and stereotypes often come to be seen as representing the entire category, and those extremes are not seen as much when members of the unmarked embody them. It's as if the brain is seen out a one-to-one -one correspondence. This counts for events, too. High-profile shootings and terrorist attacks shape how the public thinks about shooting and, and terror. Charismatic wars like World War II shape how we think about war. Our interest in the marked creates a cumulative effect problem. The cumulative effect of attending to the marked and to the extremes of the marked is to reproduce an inaccurate picture of social reality. The tendency to perceptually focus on the marked rather than the unmarked occurs in a variety of contexts. Uh, I've already talked about it in, a, in identity research, uh, but also journalists seek out interesting attention-grabbing stories. Government officials highlight dramatic and culturally salient concerns. Uh, researchers often investigate issues that are already especially culturally salient. Funding incentives to publish interesting results and to satisfy political actors further exacerbate this tendency. Even when these are individual good stories or studies, the effect is to reproduce an image of reality saturated by its outliers rather than its averages. Borrowing from Colin Hendricks' analysis of conflict, conflict studies, we might call this the charismatic megafauna problem. If we think of wars and conflicts as the marked forms of human interaction, World War II represents the marked extreme within the already marked interactional event of violent conflict. It is studied both because wars are remarkable and because as wars go, World War II is especially notable, large, morally consequential. Colin Hendricks refers to World War II as the giant panda of conflict studies. Though giant pandas and other charismatic megafauna such as tigers, leopards, elephants, and koalas represent a tiny fraction of the world's animal species, they're responsible for a massive amount of scientific policy and popular attention. In a similar fashion, conflicts that excite popular interest and imagination received the vast share of scholarly and popular attention. Hendricks notes that there was a staggering 18,028 books on World War II at the time of his writing, November 2017. No war is more heavily articulated, stud studied, written about, and discussed than World War II. He notes that there are some positive features to studying the charismatic megafauna or the dramatic. Um, it's often dramatic for a reason and can be important in its own right. Uh, and they do often serve as the gateway drugs of scientific inquiry. Charismatic events uh, draw people's attention. They get people interested. Uh, pandas interest people more than um, you know, some other animals. Um, he also notes, however, that charismatic megafauna are often unusual for reasons. They are idiosyncratic and non-representative reasons. This makes them poor cases for understanding other cases. Moreover, they can crowd out the study of other important and likely more representative organisms. In conflict studies, most scholarly attention has been devoted to thinking about atypical conflicts rather than typical ones. This means that mental models, that many of our mental models about conflict processes, diplomacy, and war tactics are derived from unusual cases. Um, he notes that senior officials in the Bush administration claimed in 2003 that coalition forces would be greeted as liber liberators and opines that given that most of them had probably read more about post-World War II occupations and liberations, than all other 20th century military occupations combined, one might see how they arrived at that conclusion. One danger in the saturation of conflict studies and understandings by the most extreme conflicts is that we under-theorize the mundane. Much like how the cumulative effect of the charismatic megafauna of World War II crowds out other more ordinary and typical wars and conflict studies, many cultures of risk assessment and understanding also develop their mental models based on eye-grabbing, atypical, and no, no, atypical novel and remarkable stories. This can come at the expense of fully appreciating the mundane. Where this occurs, we both 
underappreciate the dangers and ordinary risks, and under-theorize the importance of the mundanity of human actors. Two areas we can look at this are in perceptions of risk and perceptions of technology. Media scholars have focused on how media in the United States emphasize unusual events and scenarios and thus prime viewers uh, to fear the dramatic and unlikely events that have compelling narratives while often ignoring more realistic risks and enduring problems. In the culture of fear, why Americans are afraid of the wrong things, Barry Glasner highlights the many ways that news media emphasize spectacular cases and dramatic scenarios while ignoring more probable risks. American fe Americans fear crime from strangers, plane crashes, dramatic newsmaking viruses, while often minimizing more common risks to personal safety, such as heart disease, auto accidents, household guns, the charismatic megafauna, the dra dra dramatic and spectacular oversaturates more enduring concerns. Um, sometimes this charismatic, charismatic megafauna can be quite literal. Uh, many folks fear lakes and rivers when it's discovered that a venomous snake is present or the ocean because of sharks, um, while drowning deaths are relatively commonplace. Um, uh, I saw an, uh, an interesting kind of analysis about San Diego drowning deaths that they go down, that they go down when there are shark scares. The water becomes um, safer after there's been a shark in the water. Um, the risk of, uh, in Yellowstone there's fear of bears, but the risk of, uh, the biggest cause of death is traffic fatalities. Um, here we have um, water, traffic, things like that um, being uh, significant risks. Disaster sociologist Lee Clark highlights the distinction between probabilistic and possibilistic thinking about risk. Probabilistic thinking focuses on statistical likelihood, while possibilistic thinking focuses on risks that are rare and unlikely but could have extreme consequences if they do happen. Whereas probabilistic thinking asks what kinds of threats are likely, possibilism ask what kinds of risks have dire consequence. Clark suggests that both risk perception strategies have their uses. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, probabilistic is looking at what's likely to happen, possibilistic, what are the consequences. Um, and uh, these uh, frameworks of risk are often organizationally and culturally located. Um, prediction cultures may be interested in possibilistic thinking because they're trying to find uh, the, you know, uh, the, imagining the next possibility, uh, trying to get ahead of curves. Um, organizations and corporations will some, sometimes emphasize probabilistic risks of nuclear power or toxic chemicals, um, uh, while the surrounding publics may be more interested in possibilities of what if it does happen, not just probabilities? Um, both sources of risk perception have their own cultural blind spots. Probabilistic thinking can miss the far end of the bell curve, even in situations where it might be qu quite consequential, while possibilistic thinking can lead to a misrepresentation of threats by overestimating the unusual and underestimating more common threats. Media frames and entertainment frames often encourage possibilistic thinking. What makes something news is precisely that it is unusual. And while individual news stories about rare things happening are legitimate news, the cumulative effect is to push out more probable and enduring but ordinary issues. The entertainment format facilitates cultural attention that evokes reaction. Media sociologist David L. Tidy argues that the problem of frame, frame to news media where a narrative structure that is culturally rec resonant and focuses on a clear problem with morally spectacular and uncomplicated elements to a story drives coverage. Uh, sociologists Ruane and Cerullo similarly note that a single dramatic incident like the murder of Megan Kanka stoked concerns and fears about the risk of crime and motivated action for Megan's law but continuing high rates of infant mortality and low rates of child inoculation relative to other industrialized countries are ongoing and do not motivate the same kind of strong uh, direct response. Um, 
possibilistic risk perception cultures often highlight charismatic, spectacular scenarios and narratives while disattending to dangers of the mundane. In their recent article, Learning to Need a Gun, Harold Shapira and Samantha Simon examined the cognitive schemas of people who regularly carry guns. They interviewed 46 regular carriers and conducted field work at gun training schools. Owners express the need to carry a gun because there is the possible risk that they will face death, kidnapping, or other violent crimes if they don't carry. It's not the odds, it's the consequences, they argue, very much a possibilistic statement. At the same time that they learn to mark spe the spectacular as a threat, they also learn that guns are a relatively safe tool. Uh, NRA guidelines remind instructors to refer to guns as tools, not weapons. Journalist Dan Baum, in a memorable Harper's article, similarly reports in Conceal and Carry training courses that such classes about, are about recruiting us into a culture animated by fear. We watch lurid films of men in ski masks breaking into homes occupied by terrified women and where they were warned over and over about grave consequences and the specter that crime could be just around the corner and requires constant vigilance and never letting down one's guard. This attending to the end of the bell curve thinking has its uses. The consequences could indeed be dramatic. Members in these classes refer to non-carriers as in a condition white where they are unable to see the world as potentially seriously dangerous. But on an overemphasis on possible scenarios, the dramatic and the unusual can also lead to an overemphasis on charismatic megafauna that crowds out other species of risk. Most crimes are not random spectacular attacks on strangers, but conducted between friends and acquaintances for relatively predictable, fairly ordinary motives. A cultural em emphasis on the remarkable elements of soci society can lead us to forget that people possess technologies, skills, motivations, and strategies that are often ordinary. Like possibilistic thinking on expanding societal dangers, promoting possibilistic thinking about the potentials of new technologies, good and bad, often leads to underappreciating more mundane human realities. People behave in social networks and successful systems and rely on human-to-human -human connections. In, in my field at university, colleges often laud the latest technological advances as changing the way education works, as, as bringing new content to more people. Uh, but s something as mundane as people establishing relationships with a few other people may matter just as much or even more. That was the conclusion of an ethnographic study by sociologists Chambliss and Takax, who studied college success and found that it was not the programs or technologies that ultimately mattered, but people being valued as a person and forming social networks with a few good friends and a couple good mentors. The success of students in the institutions was having a high quality human contact. Uh, this mattered the most and what technologies were used uh, was not uh, particularly significant. Uh, they point out that the achievement of these kinds of relationships is not a new technology but goes back to ancient Greece. Rather than the latest new developments to deliver content, what matters was employing basic human relationships structured around shared endeavors. This idea that people are mundane and that the marking of the extraordinary hides this is one with broad implications. Having discussed the ways we mark and unmark mental categories and the consequences of perceptual patterns that weight some features of social reality more heavily than others in the social world, uh, what are the implications of greater cognitive attention to the remarkable and less cognitive attention to the mundane and ordinary for global security studies? Well, we can look, for starters, at linguistic marking. Um, one area we see dis discourses of the cognitively specialized and the cognit cognitively default is in the linguistic marking of newer novel technological threats. So we have um, biological weapons, which are marked as biological, versus generic uh, 
non-biological weapons. Radiological dispersal devices, or dirty bombs, versus bombs. Um, they're not actually called clean bombs, which is the part of the, you know, only the mark side is given a label. The clean bomb is implied but not uh, accentuated and, and laid out. Um, similarly, weapons of mass destruction versus weapons of destruction or weapons of WODs, weapons of ordinary destruction. Um, and then we also have the marking of certain uh, forms of terror or war as cyber terrorism or cyber war versus generic terrorism or regular war. Um, the marking of these as named special threats, unique and distinct from conventional threats, has some interesting consequences related to the cognitive distortions that can occur between the marked and the unmarked. If we go back to the characteristics of the marked and the unmarked, we might consider that oops, these marked specialized threats are often more heavily articulated in their moral significance and elevated in importance and distinction. They can receive disproportionate attention relative to their prevalence and within category distinctions can sometimes be ignored such that the characteristics of the more exaggerated members or events can color the entire category uh, while simultaneously between category differences are minimized. These technologies are extraordinary and compelling because they are novel. But the marking of them as novel, extraordinary, non-default forms can also slip into the perception that they are marked only because they are inherently more risky, dangerous, or pervasive as a threat, or that they are necessarily more risky, dangerous, or pervasive than their unmarked counterpoints. Biological weapons are a terrorist threat that is heavily articulated in journalists, security, and government communities. Narratives about the biological threat abound. A 2017 Reuters article warns that World War I saw the emergence of chemical warfare, World War II the atomic bomb, and that the next era defining superweapon could be biological. West Spain points out that warnings about biological weapon technologies have concerned security officials for decades for their potential use against civilian populations with warnings that biological weapons are readily available, easy to use, and could easily claim thousands of lives and dramatically impact the world's economy. Despite these claims, she shows that so far dramatic warnings about biological weapons have mostly not materialized. The use of biological pathogens by non-state agents has been relatively limited without huge death tolls. Those included a cult poisoning food at restaurants in Oregon, resulting in 751 injuries, but no deaths. And in 2001, a lone perpetrator conducted an anthrax attack, resulting in five deaths and 17 injuries over a period of several days. While there is a great concern that terrorists will get a hold of biological agents, so far terrorist organizations have largely embraced more mundane and readily available but still consequential technologies such as trucks and cars. Crude non-biological technologies may not be extraordinary in their novelty, but such mundane technologies can too still be highly damaging. In 1999 and in 2000, the Pentagon's Defense Threat Reduction Agency, in studying the potential of germ warfare, grew a harmless bacterium similar to anthrax to kind of test how, um, you know, how easy this would to be to do. Its director, Jay Davis, warned that a terrorist could easily grow anthrax in a facility like this and produ produce enough quality in a covert delivery to kill, say, 10,000 people in a large city. While a spectacular anthrax attack might kill thousands of people in a large city, terrorists achieved an effect not unlike this, killing th thousands in a large city with the much simpler technology of box cutters and commercial airliners. Here the large death toll was achieved not through innovative new technologies, but through a somewhat novel use of existing technologies. 
Narratives about biological weapons and other new technologies heavily articulate the dramatic potentials of newer technologies, but the imaginations of analysts about technologies both overestimate the ability of people to immediately access and employ new technologies and underestimate their ability to re redeploy old technologies. When we get so attached to the distinctiveness of our mental categories that we impose homogeneity within categories and ascribe great distance between categories, we can tend to color marked categories by their extremes. The marking of uh, weapons of mass destruction or WMDs as distinct from weapons of ordinary destruction is an interesting case where a wide array of weapons get lumped together. The definition of WMDs varies some across different agencies and by different actors, but is traditionally used to refer to chemical, biological, nuclear, and radiological weapons. Uh, the U.S. Code defines weapon of mass destruction as any weapon or device that it device that is intended or has the capability to cause death or serious bodily injury to a significant number of people through the release, dissemination, or impact of toxic or poisonous chemicals or their precursors, a disease organism, radiation, or radioactivity. WMDs include both agents specifically designed for use in war warfare and agents developed for non-military use but reused in a way to inflict harm. In their policy paper on assessing the WMD terrorist threat, Jeffrey Bale and Gary Ackerman argue that the term WMD is a problematic construct because it tends to obscure important differences between the various species of such weapons and the effects they cause. The problem, they note, is rooted in the word destruction, which traditionally connotes annihilation and physical ruin, and while nuclear weapons do lead to true destruction, many WMDs to which this term refers do not do direct physical damage to infrastructure or inflict many deaths, though they can do significant psychological damage. The term weapons of mass destruction is a deceptive homogenizing term. In the public imagination, the term usually elicits the specter of its most destructive class of weapons, nuclear weapons. Yet the term conveys a range of weapons that vary considerably in their destructive capabilities. And the splitting of unconventional weapons of mass unconventional weapons of mass destruction from conven conventional weapons of ordinary destruction can obscure that some weapons of ordinary destruction can inflict as much damage as some weapons of mass destruction. Uh, another marking contrast is between dirty bombs Radio radiological dispersal devices, and ordinary bombs. The concern over RDDs, more commonly referred to as dirty bombs, uh, is a case of this marking contrast. The presence of radioactive material in the dirty bomb gives it an importance and a distinctiveness. Uh, one can note, uh, let's see, um, oops, sorry. Um, Sorry, I lost my page. Um, concerns about terrorists using dirty bombs were heightened when it was discovered that two of the Brussels bombing sub suspects had videotaped a Belgian nuclear scientist. Here we see. Here we see a headline, Obama, world leaders discuss keeping nuclear weapons from ISIS. Um, uh, the headline is a story um, which includes, imagine the Brussels attackers who killed a dozen, who, imagine the Brussels attackers who killed dozens at an airport and train station armed with some type of nuclear material. That nightmare scenario is at the crux of concerns at the Biennial Nuclear Security Summit, a gathering of more than 50 world leaders meeting over the next two days in Washington, D.C. The meeting and the quest to keep terrorists from getting the materials for a dirty bomb 
is especially timely since investigators say some of the suspects in the Brussels attacks videotaped the comings and goings of a top Belgian nuclear scientist. Um, now, what they were talking about in the article was radiological uh, dispersal devices, um, and yet the presentation of the article with the headline nuclear weapons can easily be seen as lumping the two together. Um, similarly, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, an organization formed by former Senator Sam Nunn and Ted Turner to advocate for pre preventing terrorists from acquiring loose nukes or individual atomic warheads, warns that there are literally thousands of opportunities worldwide for terrorists to gather the radiological material for a dirty bomb that might spread panic and contaminate a section of a city for decades. While experts usually openly acknowledge that a dirty bomb made with radioactive material is not the same as a nuclear bomb, these two kinds of unconventional bombs are linked together in editorials as seemingly having more in common with one another than either has with conventional bombs. The presence of radiation in both bombs causes them to sometimes be conflated within the same category to still distinct from conventional bombs. Yet they are quite different in their overall potential. The nuclear bomb uh, can do quite significant damage. Um, uh, the United States Regulatory Commission uh, points this out um, and then talks about the cloud of radiation from a nuclear bomb could spread tens to hundreds of square miles, whereas a dirty bomb's radiation could be dispersed within a few blocks or miles of the explosion. A dirty bomb is not a weapon of mass destruction, but a weapon of mass disruption, where contamination and anxiety are the terrorist's major objectives. These are significant objectives, but they are different than the other weapons they are lumped together with. The marking of cyber terror as a unique form of terrorism has been especially susceptible to marking something as novel that then becomes heavily articulated for its moral significance and treated as especially dangerous because it is marked. Peter Singer notes that over 30,000 articles have been written about cyber terror. War and terror metaphors are common for cyber attacks. Metaphors such as Cyber 911, EWMDs, Digital Pearl Harbor, and cyber war convey an image of great strategic impact and evoke physical human casualties. Concerns over cyber attacks focus on destructive attacks on dams, power plants, and physical infrastructure. The term cyber terror lumps together and homogenizes the category by its extreme. Cyber terror is defined by the FBI includes the word violence, but as Peter Singer notes, various reports lump together everything from a digital Pearl Harbor to sabotage, to hacktivism, to WikiLeaks, to credit card fraud as cyber terror terrorism, essentially lumping a wide array of cyber acts from violence to mischief to crimes. Some of the things defined as cyber ter terror wouldn't count as terror without the marked qualifier cyber. And the war and mass destruction metaphors sometimes used with cyber terror, when other metaphors such as crime might sometimes be more accurate, can also be misleading. In warning of the cyber terror threat, journalists and government officials have considered catastrophic physical outcomes, such as taking out dams, power plants, or other massive attacks on infrastructure and people. But in many ways, terrorists have used the internet in more mundane, similar ways to how other people use the internet. They have used it as a low-cost, low-risk way to recruit members, connect people with similar interests, share ideas, tactics, and disseminate pro propaganda. As Singer states, the same kinds of tools that allow positive organizations, such as the Khan Academy, to help kids around the world learn math and science has given terrorist groups unprecedented ways to discuss and disseminate tactics, techniques, and procedures. The recipes for explosives are readily available on the internet, while terror groups have used the internet to share designs for IEDs instantly across conflict zones from Iran to Afghanistan. Rather than fully ut utilize the most sophistic poten sophisticated potentials of the internet, terrorists often use the internet to enhance their use of conventional terror tactics. 
Meanwhile, cyber threats have taken a variety of forms, which while not quite looking like war, are nonetheless damaging through relatively mundane means. Russian propaganda inter interference through Facebook and Twitter has not involved a dramatic single attack, but, but by manipulating the capacities of cyberspace in rather mundane ways that still could have significant impact on civil institutions like voting and democracy. While focus, is, focus on special categories of dramatic and remarkable novel threats captures the imagination, it can also draw attention away from the still consequential dangers in the mundane. The heavily articulated moral and political significance of unconventional technologies can distract us from the impact of other technologies. Conventional weapons and more prosaic, generic forms of terror are still causing most of the harm to human life of these kinds of threats. Even crude technologies deployed within social networks who share ideas about tactics and plans can be lethal. Sometimes terrorist innovation has very little to do with the technological cutting edge and far more to do with improving on enduring tactics of violence. In, uh, okay. In Shock of the Mundane, the authors of this recent article challenge the conventional wisdom on technological issues and point to the diffusion of something much more rudimentary and potentially more lethal. Basic infantry skills. These include coordinated small team tactical maneuvers supported by elementary marksmanship. The diffusion of such tactics seems to be underway and growing in terrorist groups and it may generate serious concern for US security policy in the future if ignored. In preparing for the possible, we attend to political violence's most remarkable elements, which are the destructive technologies that could be used. But in addition to these spectacular elements, there are still important mundane features. Threat narratives emphasizing the dramatic potential of specialized and remarkable technologies often ignore the mundanity of people using the technologies. Even when technologies are spectacular, they are deployed by people. And people, even those engaged in violence, are often mundane. The tendency to assume that the most extreme elements of political terror, their dr dramatic weapons that could be deployed, are relatively accessible, accessible to terrorists as a category is perhaps another example of homogenizing the marked category. Narratives em emphasizing the technologies often downplay the distinction between the ca capacities of the technologies and the capacities, opportunities, skills, and motivations of the people. Uh, one way to think about technology is, is much of the, the focus on technology, uh, both in security but also generally, is an emphasis on the exciting nature of technology as innovation. Um, uh, looking at the, the newest technologies uh, that, that are available. Uh, but there is also the case that technology in use matters. Uh, it turns out that folks uh, innovate not always, but not necessarily by grabbing new and innovative technologies, but by making new uses of old technologies. Um, so this concept of technique and use, uh, which David Edgerton uh, writes about in the general context, suggests that we refocus our attention on technologies, not at the moment of their invention, but instead at their ongoing moments of use. Uh, that, uh, for instance, adapting previous technologies in new ways, um, uh, developing hybrid forms of using new technologies and things like this are also important. Um, an emphasis on technology in use would focus on the maintenance of existing technologies, uh, would recognize that uh, new, new outcomes aren't always inevitable, that uh, choices involved and those choices are conducted within social networks. Those choices are made within um, a list of, pot within a range of potentials. Um, and, and that these old technologies have evolving roles uh, 
in the ecosystem, that they continue to be relevant even as the kind of invasive, the invasive species of new technologies, as, as they're sometimes represented, um, uh, also presents challenges. And, and things like bureaucracy and tactical organization of humans probably get overlooked and undervalued at times because they are not novel technologies, but the degree to which antagonistic entities deploy these assets ought to still be part of the assessment of the threats they pose. In his 2000 testimony to Congress on combating terrorism and establishing priorities, John Pericini stated that far too many policymakers and researchers rendering an assessment about terrorist use of unconventional weapons focus on what they imagine terrorists could do not on what they have done in the past, which leads them to substitute their thinking for that of the terrorists. West Spain, critical of the technology-centric approach, suggests that threat narratives that stress the ease of application and use, along with the near-catastrophic impact potential, neglect to objectively examine the critical and central role the people who use such weapons play. Mindset opportunities and technical hurdles are all part of the picture. Old technologies still matter because people matter and how they work with one another and share with one another matters. While Lamarck draws much attentional focus, the most probable and damaging threats are often still the more enduring, unmarked, everyday dangers. My primary intent today was to provide sensitizing analytic concepts and cultural cognitive tendencies to help think through the categories we construct when presented with a threat, and to think about the relationship between our attention to the extraordinary and to the mundane. It is, of course, inevitable that we will think in categories, but we should be aware of how the categories we think in shape our perceptions. I've focused a good deal on the dangers of emphasizing the novel and underestimating more probable ordinary risks, technologies, and peoples. While suggesting that we need to recognize the importance of the ordinary, and the less heavily articulated and more taken for granted dangers of the mundane, there are, of course, some good reasons why we sometimes attend to outliers and think possib possibilistically as well as probabilistically. Sometimes the charismatic megafauna really is charismatic. Lee Clark, in examining worst case scenarios, suggests the premise of po possibilistic thinking that it's the consequences, not the probability, has a place. But we might think more about um, how to uh, better assess uh, what threats to attend to. Um, while it may not, while, while I don't necessarily know exactly what, um, you know, being not a, a security expert in, in a lot of these technologies, I may not know what um, threats exactly to look for, but I'll suggest that some things we might look for or consider when assessing threats are, is the mark threat extraordinary due to its actual strategic importance or to its vividness and novelty? Considering when the strategic impact is truly extraordinary and when it is truly consequential, uh, and when it is in similar ways to its unmarked equivalent can help to determine when to still give great weight to the end of the bell curve in possibilities. Terrorists getting and being able to de detonate a nuclear weapon may be very unlikely, and they are certainly more likely to use cruder technologies, but the impact would be such that devoting energy and attention to the spectacular is still prudent. But recognizing when the danger is genuinely greater and when the danger has been saturated with the cognitive distortions involved in marking, such as when the extremes stand in for the averages, is an important sensitizing caveat to keep in mind. When we oversaturate marked categories of risk with all the characteristics of the most extreme harm, danger, capabilities of the extremes in that category, something we are more inclined to do with specialized categories than generic categories, 
we can also lose sight of the overlap between the remarkable and the mundane. Uh, the, the next point here is not only to attend to the strategic impact of those uh, of the ends of the bell curve, but also to be aware that the mundane threats may themselves be consequential and have strategic importance. Um, so that, um, uh, you know, we can see that uh, in some cases, the, the separating of the marked from the unmarked can also hide the dangers in the marked. Um, we should also attend to our issues like human organization capacity and motiva motivation accounted for uh, um, uh, and what kinds of, um, uh, what kinds of uh, strategic impact can the various can the various threats have um, uh, so that um, you know uh, threats that uh, attack our our fundamental uh, basic institutions uh, threats that um, uh, that go after the kind of mundane part of social life are also of uh, significant importance. Uh, Thank you.